So um, during this cycle, we are continuing on with the exploration of this model, the waves of wakefulness. And this is an original model that, um, that my partner Emily and I have been crafting. And really teaching it for the first time publicly here has been hugely helpful <laughs> um, because it's the first time I've really been able to get feedback from folks on, um, on, on how this makes sense, on what parts make sense, on how to kind of visually map and orient toward this model. Um, I was first <laughs> at the beginning of last cycle calling it the stages of wakefulness, um, you know, probably out of habit. And then as I started to try to like visually map this thing, I was like, wait, there are no stages here. This is just a wave. So um, that's interesting. So now it's the waves of wakefulness. Um, and the last cycle, we really explored the um, back half of this model, the sixth, fifth, and fourth positions of emergence, integration, and no escape, which uh, taken together, I would describe as the process of waking down, uh, waking down to life. Um, coming into life more fully from this position of, of really um, uh, great awakening. Um, so this cycle, we're going to focus on the first half of this model, the first, second, and third positions uh, of initial glimpse on demand, and then always already. And just a, a kind of linking to the other map that, that, that we often will use called the phases of insight. Um, the phases of insight uh, is a process, of course, of, of, of insight. And in that process, uh, in that model, the last phase uh, is called completion. And when one has worked through uh, all of these phases of insight, from seeking to effort to the breakthrough to disillusionment to equanimity and finally completion, the first time through the phases of insight completely and fully is and marks the beginning of this waves of wakefulness. So the first time you experience completion, that moment of completion is the initial glimpse. It is the, in more traditional Buddhist terms, the first stage of awakening. And so um, these two models connect directly and the phases of insight continue in the same way that the moon continues to go through phases. Uh, insight continues to go through phases as we go up and through and down and around again, these waves of wakefulness. So it's a kind of fractal model um, in that you can zoom in at any point on the wave, say into the always already position, and then you'll see these little waves within the wave, phases in the wave. So it's not just one thing, it's, it's, it's more multidimensional than that, um, our life. And of course, this map doesn't even capture the full dimensionality, no map can do that. Um, but it's an attempt at trying to um, describe some of the common territory that one experiences on the path of awakening, of paying attention. And so I think it can be helpful, even though it's inaccurate, can be helpful um, to have a map and, and hopefully a, you know, a decent map. So that's, that's what we're shooting for here. And I wanted to zoom in, you know, uh, uh, in particular on the top of the, the wave, uh, the top of the waves of wakefulness here, and talk a bit about this position, or you could say uh, this attainment of always already. And uh, to link this map to the Buddhist tradition, which I think is important because it's it is a Buddhist map in a way. Um, it's a contemplative map. Um, for me, this position of always already, it corresponds directly with, in the early Buddhist or Theravada maps, it corresponds with what they call the fourth path, the full enlightenment, arhantship. Um, and then it continues, interestingly, <laughs> beyond that. Um, and in the Zen tradition, I, I, this really corresponds to me with um, another map called Tozan's or Dongshan's five ranks, it corresponds with the third rank. Uh, or, or another way of putting it, it corresponds with this experience of what's called Dai Kensho, great enlightenment, um, in that it's, it's complete. It's complete. And, and I, I ran across this quote from Ramana Maharshi. I wanted to share that for me, it really it gets at the heart of what this position or this phase of practice is like. And here Ramana shares 
there is no greater mystery than the following. Ourselves being the reality, we seek to gain reality. We think that there is something hiding our reality and that it must be destroyed before the reality is gained. That is ridiculous. A day will dawn when you will yourself laugh at your past efforts. That which will be on the day you laugh is also here and now. And I, that last part is really key. Uh, that, the, the, that which will be on the day you laugh at your own past efforts is also here and now. Um, so it's not, again, something that the always already position points to something that can't be gained. And that's why it's so complete because if we can't gain it and, and there's a recognition of that, then there's also the recognition that it can't be lost. Or as one non-dual teacher said, marry the one who won't divorce you or who can't divorce you. It's <laughs> good marriage advice. <laughs> well, who is the one that can't divorce me? Or, uh, well, it's, it's this. It's, that, that's, it's a pointer toward always already because, of course, Everything that's born, everything that comes together can and will dissolve. Um, all states of consciousness come and go, all people come and go, all beings, all, all form, all matter comes into a particular formation and then dissolves at another time or changes. So this always already position is pointing to that which doesn't change and isn't implicated in birth and death. Dogen Zenji writes, just understand that birth and death is itself nirvana. There is nothing such as birth and death to be avoided. There is nothing such as nirvana to be sought. Only when you realize this are you free from birth and death. And I, I think there's a, there's a core paradox here. You know, I can hear it in the language of Dogen. I can hear it in the way that I talk about it. I hear it all the time when, when people talk about full awakening or full enlightenment, which is, well, how is it the case that we're realizing something that's always already been the case, and yet there's a, a necessity to realize that? <laughs> we have to recognize that, or it simply goes uh, unrecognized. And thus, in a sense, isn't true for us. And I think th this is one of the core paradoxes of the, of the spiritual journey, and it really only resolves itself at this position. That's one way to know that, that you're here is because that you get what, what one of my teachers, Kenneth Folk, called the cosmic joke. And that's the same joke that Ramana Maharshi was laughing about. You know, it's the same thing. I remember picking up Ramana's book and reading over this quote, which I'd highlighted a number of years before. And this, uh, at the time that I picked this up and read it, and it really struck me, uh, this was after, uh, a few months after I found myself at the top of this crest, uh, at the end of 2009, 2010, I was sort of in this position of always already the case. And I read this quote, and before it struck me as being something very intuitively made sense and was interesting enough to highlight, uh, at that point that I read it, I actually got the joke, and I was la literally laughing out loud uh, in response. And I was like, oh my God, I get the joke. I get the cosmic joke. What's the cosmic joke? Well, uh, the cosmic joke is you just spent the last 15 years trying to get here. <laughs> I remember I was hanging out with a Zen teacher, Jumpa Roshi, and we're getting ready to, uh, to interview him for Buddhist Geeks. And we, uh, we had a studio that was right above this coffee shop in, Col in Boulder, Colorado, that, that was, so deli was a delicious place to, to, to get coffee. And we were down there, and Jumpa was grabbing like a, an espresso or something. I said, Jumpa, where, where do you live? And in, in characteristic Zen fashion, he looks at me with this stern Zen look and goes, <laughs> So yeah, that's where we live. We live here, always already. Uh, that's where the Zen, the Zen master abides. 
Uh, and then the, hopefully the Zen master can also say, uh, I live in Missouri, <laughs> both and, but that's, that's a little for, that's integration. <laughs> and maybe, maybe, maybe Jim Poe is trying to just test my, uh, test my awareness. So my response to him, which was a very smart ass, I said, Oh, you live in the cup, <laughs> <laughs> which, you know, I knew what he was saying, but I was, I was testing him back. <laughs> that's how it goes. And so this is a lot of testing. <laughs> the other thing I wanted to mention about always already is it's a, it's a model that comes out of the Tibetan Vajrayana tradition. And the basic idea uh, in Vajrayana is that you have first, you have the ground, then you have the path, and then finally you have fruition. Ground, path, fruition. And this is a really interesting model um, because it means that in the Dzogchen and Mahamudra traditions, that they start in a different place than is typical. In, in some other paths that really more focus on the gradual nature of the path. They start with the end, they're with the ground, and they point out the, the, the ground that we're already standing on, which is itself groundless. It's a groundless ground. And it's always the case, and it's always been the case, that it's groundless, that our experience is fundamentally un, unhinged. <laughs> Um, and untethered uh, to anything that is totally solid. Um, and, and, and normally, and I think you know, this is Chagyam Trung Trungpa's analysis of the ego, is that the ego is a reaction to groundlessness. It's the sort of contracting of groundless space against its own groundlessness. And so what we realize in the ground path fruition model is we realize our ground our groundless ground, we recognize the way, what it is that we're actually looking for before we start our path. That's why there's pointing out instructions uh, and, and why that's so important in, in, in those approaches. Because if you don't get the ground or you don't see where you're trying to go, it can be a very long journey of conf just confusing states of experience with the ground, with what we're looking for. And we can just go from one state to the next, kind of state chasing looking for the big enlightenment experience. Uh, well, the big enlightenment experience is like not what anyone thinks it is. Um, and so uh, we do end up having to walk the path, <laughs> even if we have an experience of the ground, which can orient us toward the path in hopefully a better way, we still lose that recognition. We forget or we contract against groundlessness. It's too scary. Um, it's too much. And as we gradually learn how to relax, to be compassionate toward ourselves and others, to release and trust in groundlessness, which also means trusting in uncertainty, you know, that we don't really know what's going to happen, um, then, then we become more familiar, more and more familiar with this sort of non-seeking uh, or not knowing quality um, of awareness, of experience, to the point where nothing fools us anymore. We know every experience that arising is empty. And there's a deep trust. Even if we still go through our habits and we freak out and we get confused and deluded, there's some part of us that always remembers. You know, uh, and actually doesn't even need to remember because this is true regardless of whether or not we're remembering or we're forgetting. You know, it's the nature of experience. So forgetting is just another experience. Falling asleep is another experience. Getting confused is another experience. Being deluded is another experience. Um, and so we can see that actually the delusions, craving, seeking, all of those things are also empty. It's not that they have to stop. There's no requirements for, for emptiness, for enlightenment. If we put a requirement on it, that's not it. In this aspirational prayer for Mahamudra, Rangjung Dorje describes it this way. He says, it doesn't exist. Even the victorious ones haven't seen it. Even the Buddhas, the fully enlightened ones, haven't seen it. It is not non-existent. 
because it is the basis of all samsara and nirvana. This is not a contradiction because this is the unity of the middle way. May we realize the true nature of mind, which is free from all limitations and extremes.